The following is a presentation of Castleview Baptist Church in Indianapolis, Indiana. Her name is Jessica Buchanan. Jessica and her husband, Eric, served as aid workers in northern Somalia, specifically trying to deal with landmines. And in 2011, Jessica, serving in the northern part of Somalia, which is a relatively safe area, traveled with a co-worker of hers named Peter down to southern Somalia where they were going to go for some additional training. This was, though a tense time, still nevertheless, due to the aid of their interpreter as well as the person who was securing their transportation, still felt relatively safe with this opportunity. But tragically and suddenly on their way back, their car was forced over and Jessica and her colleague Paul were captured by land pirates in Somalia. And they were held hostage for as high as $45 million. Eric, unfortunately, her husband received this call, learning of this from their agency, and then felt helpless as day after day, week after week, month after month went by, how emotionally difficult this was, how the mind in one sense tried to hold on to hope, and yet the flickering thoughts of what if, the tragic possibilities that were considered. Well, on the 93rd day of their captivity, in the middle of the night when gunfire suddenly erupted, the blanket was pulled off of her face and someone said to her, in English, we're the American military. We are here to save you. We're here to take you home. You're safe now. As the Navy SEALs had come and had secured her safety, rushed her out of there and brought her to what would be eventual reunion with her husband. It seemed like an impossible situation during that time of captivity. So much time had passed, so many difficult circumstances, sleeping outside in the wilderness under guards, worried that they would be kidnapped by another group, a worse group by which her death would seem guaranteed, if not worse. There seemingly was nothing they could do to save themselves, nor even the ones who loved them. Eric, Jessica's husband, felt hopeless over these months, but then, to the surprise and delight of all, another intervened and saved Jessica, when seemingly all hope was lost. It's amazing a story as this is, and the interviews that have been given, and the books that have been published, all of which you can read and see for yourself. Even more amazing than this is another story of a rescue that all of us who are now Christians can identify with. All of us who are now Christians can know what it's like to be seemingly held hostage with no hope of escape, with all of the love and compassion and effort and energy of our loved ones to save us, but outside of their ability to do so, seemingly lost with all, all, without any hope or any help, to then know what it's like to be ransomed, to be redeemed, to be set free who once were in prison. Friend, that is the story of amazing grace. That is the story that each one of us who are in Christ can tell today. That's a story that we're going to look at for ourselves. This morning marks, as Kelly said at the beginning of our morning service together, the beginning of an eight-week series that we'll be in together, a series on evangelism, a series on what it means to proclaim the excellencies of God in Christ Jesus, His Son, a series on what it means to be realizing the significance of the gospel message as we have believed it, having heard it, to then be entrusted with it that we might tell it to others so that they might hear it as well. Quite honestly, this is a challenge that many people seem at a loss for. It's not as if they're at a loss to realize the subject, but rather at a loss to do anything with it. 
It's one in which we acknowledge is true and important, and we're glad to be the recipients of another's faithful evangelism in private conversation, in relative association, or in the public proclamation, but rather ourselves seemingly still stalling and waiting. It's my hope in the next eight weeks to commission us as a church, to commission us to the great mission that God has given us, that each of us and every one of us would be mobilized, whether we live in, assistant, li- live in assisted living quarters or we're living on our own in apartments or whether we're occupying space with other relatives, no matter where we are, no matter where we work, no matter what our age, no matter how our health is, that each of us would understand the joy of the invitation that God has given to us to be ambassadors. Over the next eight weeks, as we've heard already, we will have continued ways by which we can accent this time together. I strongly encourage you, if you have not already done so, find and commit to, as a member of this local church, one of the fellowship groups here, one of these groups that will meet on a regular basis, where you'll be given the opportunity to study and to think and to discuss and to hear from others and to be encouraged and be prayed for in your own pursuit of gospel proclamation. In addition to participating in a fellowship group in our Wednesday night Bible studies that we offer here every Wednesday night, in this coming semester that we'll have here together at the church, studies on this time. And over these weeks, I hope it's not simply the teaching that you'll hear. I also hope it's the prayer that you'll hear and the prayers that you'll give. And the opportunity that you'll have to give a direct and intentional effort to think lastingly and longingly that God would do this work not only in you but in the rest of us. As you begin to identify people by name to whom you would love to see God save, to whom you would love to see God open their eyes and open their ears that they might see and hear and believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Towards the end of our time, as we finish this series in March, we will conclude this series together at the end of eight weeks with this realization that two weeks later is Easter Sunday, March 27th. comes early this year. March 27th being Easter Sunday is a morning by which we want to capitalize on what are still the vestiges, the remnants, the remains of cultural Christianity that still sort of looms in our society around us. Other parts of the country have shed that long ago, but still seemingly in our Midwest morality, seemingly still in our Americana Christianity that still is the era that many of us breathe around us, there are still those who might be willing to the friendship you have with them, to the working relationship you have with them, to entertain the invitation, to be willing to accommodate the request, to join you as you gather here each and every Sunday, but especially on Easter Sunday. I would love to see this room double in size as every single person even now begins to prayerfully consider whom they would want to identify to bring with them for every person we have here, every person we would love to see bring to hear the gospel. Not because we think that that's simply all that it takes. Not so that we might let that be a replacement for your own communication but that we might use as an opportunity, a catalyst for our congregation to have this conversation in private relationships, both building up to and in response to that conversation on Easter Sunday as the word is preached, as Christ and Him crucified is lifted up. So I pray even now you'd begin to consider whom you would love to see come with you, join with you, sit with you, and participate with you in this time of worship on Easter Sunday. At Castleview, we say the following. We are committed to developing gospel-centered disciples and proclaiming the gospel of Christ to the world. What we're simply saying in that statement is that it is our intention to do two things, primarily as a church and uniquely as a church. We're intending to take the Christians that God has given us in assembly as He has converted us and brought us together through His providential hand, and in so doing so, to develop us, to mature us, that we might live our lives in light of the gospel, that we might not ever for a second think that in time, due to our own progressive sanctification, that God is needing a little bit less of His righteousness on the cross because of how much we're contributing to ourselves, but rather we're only and always saved by His grace. Whether we've been saved for one day or we've been saved for decades, 
Yet it's all by grace. But living out that in such a way that we might obey the Word of God. We are disciples. Jesus is our discipler, and we follow in His footsteps. But we're also, as I've said there, also committed to proclaiming the gospel of Christ to the world. If you think about it, local churches who have been around for any length of time, who have any kind of size to them, inevitably in time begin to build themselves around different ministries. They begin to have children's ministries. They begin to have youth ministries. They have music ministries. They get involved in Bible studies for men and women. They do all kinds of activities, and they build buildings, and they pay utilities, and they think of programs, and they print brochures, and they have events, and they have conferences, and they give out books, and they offer lessons, and all of this is happening in such a way that in time, over time, there's just too much that any one person could participate in. But seemingly, if due to the personality of the people involved or those who are giving leadership or the particular idea, how that connects your area of interest, you seemingly as a Christian can be involved in an endless treadmill of Christian activity that seemingly is good and right and a manifestation of what is prescribed and given in the Word of God. But in time, there comes a problem for every local church. It's what's referred to organizationally as mission drift. It's when you started out with one purpose, with one intent, but over time you begin to forget that as in time everything begins to crowd into that. So that eventually you're doing things because it's seemingly the right thing to do, but over so much time you forget, why was I even doing this to begin with? That's why we make the statements that I've just referenced there. We make these statements to remind us, why are we here? Even this morning, why are you sitting here? What are you hoping to accomplish? What brought you into this room this morning? Well, if you're a Christian, we hope it would be in response to the gospel that in light of his salvation that he has offered you and you responding through faith in Christ alone by his grace alone for your forgiveness and eternal life that you'd respond with the desire to worship. But that worship has an outworking manifestation and that is you live in obedience to the Word of God. We hope that you've come this morning to learn the Word so that in learning you might obey. And in doing so, others might learn and that then they would obey, making more disciples. And a part of that obedience is so that you and I would learn repeatedly and increasingly and faithfully how to proclaim the gospel of Christ. How to do that. Not simply the mechanics or the methods, but rather the very message itself. Over the next eight weeks, we'll stare at that and study that and think about that. But this morning, we begin, if you will, at ground zero, taking a look at Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19 is our text, starting in verse 1 to give the context, though our verse for this morning and our purposes will be in verse 10. Luke chapter 19. For those of you who are not familiar with the Scriptures, maybe don't even have a copy of yourselves, want to just make you aware that we do have Bibles for free in the lobby at the Welcome Center as you walk out to the right in an accurate and readable translation. Feel free this morning to listen on as I read this copy to you. Luke chapter 19. For those of you not familiar with the story of Luke, it's written by a Gentile, a non-Jewish person who was a physician who wanted to study the, the, the claims of Christ, wanted to look into these, these claims that were being made about him. And so he wrote the book of Luke and the book of Acts. Sort of Acts is like Luke part two. And here we have in the book of Luke the ministry of Jesus as Luke records it. And we have this scene that unfolds before us, Luke chapter 19. Look at it with me. He, being Jesus, entered Jericho and was passing through. Behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him. For he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, 
for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who was a sinner. Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. And then here's our text for the morning, verse 10. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Before we consider our ministry, our calling, our purpose for being here, as we shall all do in the coming weeks, this morning I want us to stop and consider the purpose of Jesus' first coming. I want us to consider His ministry, His mission, what He was called to do, as He says it Himself in His own words. Now, just to make a few observations of this text in Luke chapter 19, you have what's been happening now already at Luke chapter 19, a ministry that has been prolific in its impact and its reach. Uh, Nicodemus, uh, excuse me, Jesus has been reaching different people with the gospel to the point where he has a reputation, and Zacchaeus has known of this reputation. He wants to see him for himself. And we can imagine the kind of crowd that we're talking about here. It would not be a small crowd, it would be a large crowd. It's a kind of a large crowd that if you've ever seen people gathered around something that's happening, you have to kind of decide, you have to find a higher vantage point to see, or is there some way that I can kind of get in between the crowd to see something? you ever been at, at a place where they might have outside street entertainers or performers? You understand what this is like. We're sort of crowded around a group of people. Maybe they're watching a magic show or they're watching sort of cartwheel or entertainment in that sense. And you're sort of wondering what's happening there. That sort of crowd draws you in. Well, here we have Zacchaeus knowing about, hearing about, and then knowing that that crowd is for Jesus. But he, he can't see him himself. So he takes measures into his own hand. He takes some steps to be able to remedy this problem. He climbs a tree. He climbs a tree. Now, oh, how, how cute this is. The guy climbs a tree as if he's a child climbing a tree, he wants to see something. Friends, you have to understand the significance of this. Zacchaeus is a, cha- a tax collector. He is a chief tax collector. He is somebody that in one sense is respected because of his power, but despised because of his position. Because his position came with power, nevertheless, his position was still reviled. Because this man collected taxes on behalf of the Roman government from fellow Jewish people. And he was a powerful man. He was identified as a chief tax collector in his prominence and obviously a very successful man. He was rich. After he would collect these taxes, he would take a cut for himself. And in so doing so, taking this cut for himself, he would keep the leftovers and apparently kept so much, either by percentage or by the sheer volume of taxes he collected, he was known for being a rich man, a despised man, but nevertheless a respected man. Well, here is this rich, respected man climbing a tree, willing to put himself in a seemingly shameful posture and position that would not be associated with someone of his position because of his eagerness to hear and to see Jesus for himself. Well, what happens next is nothing less than divine in its orchestration and providence. Verse 5, Jesus came to that place, looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down. I must stay at your house today. Notice, if you will, how this relationship begins. It begins with Jesus calling Zacchaeus to himself, telling him to come down and that he intends to stay with him. And what's significant here in verse 6 is seemingly a hospitality reference to the untrained eye, but rather if you stare at it and you see the implications of what happens here in verse 8 and 9, you see so much more because it says here in verse 6, he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. Now, this is not because Zacchaeus is all excited to show off his pad. This is not because Zacchaeus somehow feels privileged that he's about to throw a a party that other people wish they could be a part of. 
It is instead rather the outworking of what Zacchaeus here has now believed in and proven by his response to what comes later in verse 8 and 9. He believes that Jesus is indeed the Christ, and he intends to follow him with his life. He intends to indeed follow him and to demonstrate that in such a way that everybody else around him could not deny it. How does he do this? Well, verse 8, he said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I've defrauded anyone of anything, which I can assure you he did, I restore it fourfold. To which Jesus says to him, Today salvation has come to this house since he is also a son of Abraham. He's not making a reference to his ethnicity. He's making a reference to his faith. For all who believe in Christ as the Son of God, as the Scripture goes on later to say in Galatians and other passages, are true children of Abraham. What's happening here? What's happening is that you have a sinner who is despised by society, who has built his fortune on the backs of others, willing to give any and all of it up for Christ, willing to put himself in a position of shame and dishonor, willing to be reviled by others because it did not matter if indeed he could be accepted by Christ. And he was. Hurry and come down, Jesus says to him. And what does he respond? Responds with receiving him joyfully. But I want you to see the contrast. This passage would be remarkably amazing and sweet if it was not for the killjoys in verse 7. And when they saw it, they all grumbled because he has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Now, this one verse is actually setting up what we're going to look at in verse 10. This actually is the verse that in some respects is the crux of the passage here because it's the introduction to the mission that Jesus says himself he's come to do. See, the problem is this. The problem is that Zacchaeus is not liked by anybody. It doesn't matter who you pick. He is not respected highly at all in the sense that people emulate him. You don't have little children of people decided saying, when I grow up in kindergarten class, when I grow up, I want to be a tax collector. Right? I mean, that's just not a common expression. Now, maybe because of the money associated with it or seemingly the, the power it had in society, there might be some, but seemingly when they had a bit of a moral compass, they might say, yeah, I don't want to be associated with that. That's not something I want to be known for. Like someone growing up today say, when I grow up, I want to be a thug. I want to be a gangster. There might be somebody who in difficult communities might see it as a place of power or with wealth, but if they have any sense of moral compass and reference, it's not something they want to emulate or to follow. Here is a man who is seemingly despised in society, rejected undeniably by all moral reference points known as sinner. Not simply by God's standards, by our standards. The people that when they walk in the room, we kind of grab our children and pull them closer. The people that when they walk in the restaurant, we kind of make eye contact, not really, we look down, and then we kind of lift up the menu to kind of look over the top of the menu. Are they looking still? These are the people that we pray our children to grow up and be like. And the last thing these are are the people that we want to be caught in public with, let alone be dining with let alone be friends with. That's the perspective here. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. You know what they're saying is? Guilt by association. Guilt by association. Jesus, if this is the company you keep, it says a lot about who you are. It says a lot about what you like. It says a lot about your appetites, your relationships, your interests. Jesus says in verse 10, in response to this, 
after offending them of who was a true son of Abraham, he says, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Now, here's a question everybody has to answer. Are you lost? Are you lost? Ironically, in this passage, Zacchaeus knew he was lost, and the religious thought they weren't. The seemingly morally upright, the seemingly the societally respected were the lost ones, while the guy who was despised and rejected, who was clearly thought of as a crook and to not be associated with, he was the one that sought out Jesus. As it says there, he was seeking to see who Jesus was. Friends, here in verse 10, there are some observations we need to make. And this is where we'll spend the remaining time. First of all, we need to see there is no salvation apart from Jesus Christ. There is no salvation apart from Jesus Christ. In the very beginning of verse 10, it says the following, for the Son of Man. What's so remarkable about this is that Jesus is the one speaking here. This isn't Luke giving commentary. This is Jesus referring to Himself as this. He is the the Son of Man. This is both a a remarkable statement, both because of its, its humility and its prophetic claim to deity. It's humility in that he accented, he accented, if you will, how he was in his personhood, how he was, as we later learn in Mark chapter 10, verse 45, that the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. And his humility, as Paul describes him in Philippians 2, but also as how Daniel describes him. As Daniel says in chapter 7, that the Ancient of Days, which is a, an Old Testament description, a title for God the Father, looks to see who is the righteous one that can handle and open and control and, and issue authority over his degrees, his decrees rather, and it says, one who is coming known as the Son of Man. And it's Jesus. See, what we need to first of all understand is that Jesus is making a claim here not only of his humanity, but also of his deity. That Jesus is 100% man and 100% God. He is God in the flesh. There is no salvation apart from the recognition of who Jesus of Nazareth is. Some of you perhaps are here today, maybe even having been here at times before, maybe even been raised in a church such as this one, and you believe Jesus is to be admired, to be respected, to be appreciated, and in many respects, as much as possible, to be emulated. His compassion is remarkable. His wisdom is head-turning. His patience is, is, is worth writing about. But you cough on, you trip on going so far as to actually recognize that He is God Himself in human form. Without the recognition of Jesus' deity, there is no true salvation. There can be no pardon, no escape, no rescue, no ransom, apart from, first of all, recognizing who God is in His Son. John chapter 6. There's a remarkable story. You don't need to turn there, but I'll just read it to you. In John chapter 6, it's kind of a, a sad story and an encouraging story at the same time. It says in verse 66, after this, many of his disciples, referring to Jesus, turned back and no longer walked with him. That big crowd that Jesus is known for started to thin out. Verse 67, so Jesus said to the twelve, do you want to go away as well? John chapter 6, verse 68, Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Where do we go? That's a question we all have to answer for ourselves. Where where do you go? Where do you go when you come to the end of yourselves? Poor humanity, distracted by our perplexities, bleeding from many wounds, weeping over many griefs. We have to go somewhere. When your body is sick, you go to the hospital. 
But when your soul is sick, where do you go? Where do you go? Where does your groaning and your longing take you? To whom do you turn? The rest of the passage in verse 68 of John chapter 6, Peter says the following to Jesus, you have the words of eternal life, and we have believed. We know who you are, we know what you're saying, and we have believed, and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Peter is saying, there is no hope. There is no redemption. There is no salvation apart from Jesus Christ. You see, what I want us to understand here in John chapter 6 and in Luke chapter 19 is that there is a condition that everybody has to first of all identify that's true about themselves and that we might even have to help them in that conversation to identify about themselves, and that is that they are longing, they are groaning, they are hurting, they are waiting for something more. We're looking for redemption, for rescue. The narrative plot of some future hope, of some eternal life, whether it be in our fictitious movies or books we read, whether it's the stories we tell, the characters we create, we're looking for something more than what we currently have because what we have is not enough. Some of the followers of Jesus turned away thinking there was some other place to go. But the true disciples of Jesus in John chapter 6 said, you are the one. We have heard, we have believed, you have the words of eternal life. You are the Holy One of God. The second observation in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, is that the purpose of Jesus' ministry was to save others. Look at it there. For the Son of Man came to what? To seek and to save. To seek and to save. What's remarkable about this is the reminder of who was responsible for salvation. It's not man, it's God. God has from the very beginning of time, from His initial act of creation, to His promise of redemption, to His orchestration of history, to the revelation of His Son, to the sacrifice and death and resurrection of His Son, to the promised return of Him, to the preservation of His Word, has always and forever been about initiating and accomplishing redemption. That what He pledged to happen in eternity past he would bring to completion. It's worth reading in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Paul describes this grand work of salvation. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace, and with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished on us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of His will according to His purpose." which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who are the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. What you're reading here in verse 10 is the promise that was already made in Ephesians 1, as it's talked about, is now being kept here in Luke chapter 19. For every promise made by God is a promise kept by God. God the Father commissioning God the Son. God the Son willingly taking on human form, becoming as a man, fully in appearance, seeing every temptation, every opportunity that in doing so, he might be the only righteous one to make sacrifice on the cross, to be accepted by God the Father, 
payment for all those who would believe in Him. What's remarkable about this is that Jesus is simply saying what He already did earlier, right? With Zacchaeus. Jesus came to the place. He looked up. He said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down. You know what this is? This is a physical story of what we know with Lazarus, the same thing that happens spiritually speaking, which is Jesus raises people from the dead. Jesus calls people to himself. Later on in Ephesians chapter 2, that very passage we read earlier in chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 2, describing our condition and how we were found in our natural disposition and how we interacted and thought accordingly and who it is we worshiped. It describes us as the following. It says, you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Verse 4, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even passes, made us alive together with Christ. For by grace you have been saved. See, the purpose of Jesus' ministry was not first and foremost to eradicate poverty, to provide political reform, to provide sanitation, to give a chance for illiteracy to be eradicated. Jesus' ministry was about seeking and saving all those who realize they need a Savior. Only sinners need saviors. And all of you who are here today who are Christians have realized that. You could not save yourself. It didn't matter what you've accomplished, what you've done, what you've tried. It's all been a futile, vain attempt. But only Christ can provide for you. Salvation. Jesus in His mercy does not wait for us to seek Him. He comes after us. He finds us in the muck and the mire. He finds us in the trenches of our circumstances in the loneliness of our hearts, in the difficulty of our relationships, and the emptiness of our accomplishments. And he speaks out to us from his word and calls us to himself. He is seeking and he is saving. Third observation we make here is that Jesus' salvation is for sinners. There's no salvation apart from Jesus Christ The purpose of Jesus' ministry was to save others, and Jesus' salvation is only for sinners. That's what it says here. He came to save the lost. Some of you right now listening to the sound of my voice are not Christians, and the fundamental reason why is because you don't think you need saving. And until that changes in your understanding and your reference point of yourself, then I mean to say this kindly to you, but very matter-of-factly, there is no hope for you. Why? Because only at the point by which you realize you need salvation is then salvation offered to you. The grace of God. Reminded in Luke chapter 5, Jesus says, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. See, the reason why this message is so important for non-Christians and for Christians is because the non-Christian needs to hear how Jesus is extending himself towards you no matter how you have lived and no matter who you are. Because perhaps for a number of you, you might be thinking, oh, you don't realize what I've done. You don't realize the acts of sin I've committed, the abortions that I've had, the acts of infidelity that I've participated in, the vile things that I have spoken, the acts of thievery or criminal actions that I have taken. Trust me, I think if you knew all that I did, you would amend your message, Eric. Friend, I don't know all the things you've done. And I don't have to know all the things you've done. God already does. And even in spite of all that you've done and more, He extends Himself to you because the reality is you don't even realize all that you've done. 
you're more sinful than your worst assessment of how bad you are. Like, well, that's a real party favor there. You're a real happy guy to hang out with. My point is this. As if to think you might be outside the grace of God because of how you assess yourself, you're actually even further outside, not outside the grace of God, but further away from where you currently think you are in your assessment. And in the farthest reaches of that assessment, God's arm is long, the Scripture says, and He reaches to you to pull you to Himself to save you. What is undeniable, you cannot save yourself. No more that Jessica could set herself free from her slavery in the middle of the wilderness of Somalia. Could you save yourself, nor could your loved ones save you, but God reaches towards you in His mercy. Now for the Christians, which a majority of people sitting in this room are Christians. You say, well, this is sort of an evangelistic talk. Good for you, Eric. You tell those people. They need to hear this too. This is good. I remember I heard this talk for the first time. Friends, you understand as a Christian, you need to realize something. This is your testimony. You're not just listening to the conversation of most. This is your testimony. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost sinners. No matter how well you thought of yourself, there came a point in which you had to repent of your sins and put your faith in Christ and only that faith. And even that was a gift. What does this do? Oh, as we've said before, we say again, this story of the gospel is just an automatic uh, injection of humility into how Christian assesses themselves. And it's an automatic heart softener for how maybe you've been treating others as well, Christian and non-Christian. There's no place for self-righteousness among Christians. There's no place for judging others. Not in light of what you see here in the mission of Jesus. Let me realize, without this verse, and this verse is simply a summary of other verses, and really the summary of the Scriptures, that this is sort of the grand climax of all that the revelation of God's been pointing to. Without this, there is no hope. But because of this, you now have hope, and the question is, will you maintain the reality of that in light of the conversion that God has given to you? And offer that towards others. Only those who are sick. Only those who are sinners. I think, unfortunately, we're nervous around sin, and probably rightly so in some respect because we have a, a sobering awareness of it and its lure towards us. We, therefore, want to shy away from it lest we might be tempted to fall into it. This is certainly the driving or one of the driving uh, motives behind a lot of parenting that happens with children, trying to preserve them from sin and its effects. But somewhere along the way, there comes a problem that creeps into our belief. And it's what we read earlier in Luke chapter 19, verse 7. People grumbling because Jesus has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. I'm not saying that this is a proof text for you to find the worst people in your life and go after them, but perhaps for some of you, this is an opportunity to assess, are there been people that you have been skirting around, that you have been bypassing, and maybe even worse, that you have been judging, but you've never stopped and actually prayed for them and desired to reach out to them and realize that maybe God was putting you in their life? life for a reason because of Jesus Christ. You see, I want to be clear in what I'm saying, and I'm not saying in this text. You're not doing the saving. This is not your mission in the sense that you are called to seek and to save the lost. You're not a mini Jesus. You're not offering salvation from yourself, but you are an ambassador. You are a proclaimer. You are a testifier of somebody who understands firsthand what it means to know the kindness and mercy of God who can make that assessment of yourself and offer that same hope towards others. So we think of it again. The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And all of God's people said amen. 
And all of those who are not God's people are saying, you mean me? And God is saying, yes, even you. All those who are lost, Jesus offers salvation to. We've talked about Jesus' mission. Next week, we're going to talk about our mission, your mission. We know why Jesus came, but the question is, what about you? Why does God have you still here if you are now a Christian? Next week, we'll begin to unpack that. Let's pray. This has been a presentation of Castleview Baptist Church in Indianapolis, Indiana. For more information about our church or our senior pastor, Eric Bancroft, please click on the link below or visit castleview.org.